everybody, and welcome back to TechStrong Unplugged. This is episode nine of our series, and I'm your host, Etan Sol. On TechStrong Unplugged, we dive into all things tech and get people up to speed with everything happening across the industry. Recently, our co-host, Cassandra Chin, went to the Great International Developer Summit, also known as GITS 2024. At GITS 2024, Cassandra sat down with Daniel Hinojosa, who is a self-employed developer and educator with 25 years of experience. Daniel discusses his journey from focusing on Java to incorporating other technologies like Scala and Kafka. He also touches on the importance of continuous learning and effective teaching techniques. Finally, Cassandra and Daniel explore the intersection of AI and Java, as well as the ethical concerns and potential for AI in various industries. Without further ado, let's head over to Gits 2024. Welcome back to Textron Unplugged. I'm your host, Cassandra Chin. And today we're here with Hino Hosa. Yep. Our, uh, my first name is Daniel. Oh, I was looking for my badge. <laughs> <laughs> my first name is Daniel and uh, my last name is Hino Hosa. So they, they had to switch the name. Um, so that's why it was a little confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Hino Hosa is a uh, derivative of Hino Ho, which is uh, fennel. That's really cool. Yeah. Can you do a short introduction? Uh, I'm a developer. I've been uh, self-employed since 1999. So I think I'm going on in my... Uh, 25th year, which is uh, kind of interesting. So, um, yeah, uh, so 25 years. I just realized that right now. So in December, I'll have been self-employed for 25 years. I've uh, been doing a lot of development. I staked everything uh, on Java. So um, at the very beginning, one of the reasons why I went self-employed was to um, you know build a business around this language called Java. And uh, probably one of the best decisions I ever made since what kind of work do you do when you're self-employed? Uh, I've done a lot of things, and uh, I I decided to start my work as a contractor who does code for, you know, institutions. Uh, it could be education, it could be government, it could be a wide range of different things. So I decided to be that Java consultant. Uh, this was at a time where a lot of companies didn't have that infrastructure, didn't have programmers. So it was a really good prime time in order to do that. But as time went on, everyone started creating their own IT departments, having their own uh, kind of uh, IT campuses where they would hire loads of programmers. So they all started having their in-house thing. And um, I started to integrate things like presentations where I'm on the No Fluff Just Stuff tour and uh, do uh, instructional training. So I have a lot of customers for that, and that's, that's, uh, that's a blast as well. One of the things I like about it is that I get to talk to other people. And whenever I do trainings or things like that, one of the best parts about that is I always end up learning more than, uh, than the audience just based on their questions. So I absolutely love that part. That's one of the greatest things about it. What is the training exactly? Uh, I do trainings, uh, typically Java. So, of course, you know, since I have a lot of experience with Java, uh, it will be that. But uh, also my other favorite language is Scala, which is a uh, JVM-based language. Uh, I do a lot of uh, Kafka trainings. I do uh, DDD trainings and, uh, yeah, a few other things. I recently created a list since i gotten older. I've created a list of, like, the technologies I'm going to pay attention to and really just focus on that. Um, I was guilty of, like, chasing uh, bright, shiny objects all the time. Uh, but now I'm getting older. I'm just going to constrict that and just, you know, focus on that. But, uh, yeah, those are typically the trainings that uh, I focus on today. So what, what is in your focus bubble? Yeah, in that focus bubble, I have Java, Scala. Uh, I have uh, architecture, domain-driven design, uh, including some of those. I have some things like, you know, video editing and some other uh, things that I'd like to include with that. Machine learning is absolutely one of them and how to deploy that. Uh, ML ops. So those are, those are some of the few. I'd have to take a look at the full list there, but uh, yeah. I think. Like, there's an issue around, like, Java and machine learning not really being yeah, compatible. Falling behind, yeah. So Java really needs to catch up. I'm uh, really excited about some of these new Java enhancement processes that are coming out. Uh, the foreign function memory interface uh, is one of them to where we could tap in a little bit better natively to the underlying OS because uh, Python has certainly done that. If you take a look at most Python libraries, underneath everything is just going to be a C library. Uh, Java, I think, felt the need to tap into that operating system uh, a little bit more. So um, 
they're going that route. And also vector API on how to tap into the processor and do calculations a, a lot faster. So I think Java still has the opportunity to catch up. I think they've fallen behind, but a lot of it was, I wouldn't say a surprise, but Python took, um, you know, ran away with it uh, for quite a while. So Java has some catch up to do, but I'm pretty confident they're going to do well, but they do have a lot of work. There's a lot of Java developers, so I'm definitely hoping it gets there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned that term earlier, which I totally forgot. Oh, yeah, Pomodoro Technique. So, yeah, Pomodoro Technique, uh, Italian for tomato is what Pomodoro stands for. Um, and I, I'll recommend this to anyone. If you are a student, even if you're like a grade school student, if you're in college, I wish someone told me this when I was in college, but uh, hey, it is what it is. Uh, I've been doing this for about 10 years. And the idea is if you have a thing you need to do and you want to focus on that one thing, you will estimate the number of Pomodoros that it takes in order to do it. One Pomodoro is 25 minutes with a five minute break. If you're someone who suffers from things like back pain and a few other things, do the Pomodoro technique. Uh, I think you're going to do well. And I'm not going to say it's going to be some kind of miraculous thing, but getting up is going to be a key factor in a lot of things. One of the effects that you get from it is not only less back pain uh, from sitting down too much, uh, but have you ever had that effect that you were trying to solve a particular problem and it was really, really hard and you've sat down on it and you're suffering, you're suffering, you're suffering, you can't come up with a solution but the moment you you get up and you walk away, within that five minute time, you're like, oh, that's what it is. I just remembered what it is. Oh, this or this is going to be a much better idea. That's the thing that you're trying to achieve with that Pomodoro effect. You know, constantly getting up and and uh, thinking about your particular problems because you'll always solve the problems when you're not on the computer. So 25, five, 25, five. You do that four times and then you take a longer break. It actually happens to me a lot where I'm at the computer and like sometimes I just forget what I was supposed to do. Yeah, absolutely. Like you forget the most important task and you start doing other random things. Yeah, and that's the other thing. It's a 25 minute, but you have to be focused on one particular thing. That way you don't, oh, I'm, oh, look at that web page. I'm going to go ahead and do that. <laughs> yeah, and so it keeps you on track. That's the, and thanks for bringing that up because that's one of the absolutely major good points about using that Pomodoro technique. Been using it for 10 years, and I usually don't enthusiastically, like, you know, uh, say, you know, recommend something like this, but Pomodoro technique has absolutely been there. And I think if you have, you know, consistency with it, uh, aim first for like maybe five Pomodoros first, but, you know, get used to it. Uh, I try to aim for 12, which is, uh, you know, if you don't have any meetings, that's like six hours of work. And, um, yeah, I think you're going to get a lot out of it and it'll kind of like push you forward. So if you need that sort of thing, I think you really enjoy that. What kind of work would you use the Pomodoro technique on? Um, definitely not meetings, uh, for one, cause I mean, meetings are just so, so random in nature. So those kind of days you would probably have like five or six Pomodoros, but if you have a programming task, uh, if you have recordings, since I know you do recordings, you know, tasks that you need to do, tasks that you need to focus on. I need to study for this. I need to write a paper. I need to do these sort of things. Pomodoro technique is where that's going to work. Absolutely amazing. And it's going to help you get up so that way you're not sitting and you're not suffering, you know, over a particular task over and over. How do you deal with the blingy messages which keep calling for your attention while you're working? Don't do it. Yeah. So if you have, you know, don't look at your email. But here's the thing. It's 25 minutes for doing that. And it's not a lot of time. So if you don't respond quickly to that email message, uh, you have that 25 minutes, you should respond to people. And we just saw a talk on Ken cousin on managing your manager, you have to, you have to, you know, uh, you know, report or respond uh, to requests. But 25 minutes is not that long. And that's one of the really nice things about that 25 minutes. If someone interrupts you, uh, the idea for Pomodoro technique is you can say, let me just finish this. I have about five minutes in my Pomodoro, uh, or you could just say I have five minutes left and that's not a long time. And if you build up a trust that you're always going to get back to a particular person, then, you know, more and more people are going to leave you alone at that critical time. I see. So they have to get used to your style. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Your nuances. 
Uh, but if other people ask about it, and, um, you know, I've introduced people to the Pomodoro technique uh, using that. So. Do you ever recommend it in your talks? I do. Uh, ev you know, every once in a while when it come up and if it's uh, going to be relevant. I did have a talk on uh, Pomodoro technique itself, but uh, I haven't done that in quite a long time. But, yeah, I'll, I'll usually recommend that. I want to try to think about when I uh, I have used that every now and then. Uh, but, yeah, I'll just name drop it every once in a while. Okay. Uh -huh. I like sometimes it's good to take a break from, like, the t heavy technical content. Yeah, you know what? Uh, someone uses it on the weekends, and I gave it a try. Like, I like playing video games, watching YouTube, things like that. But I find myself sitting, enjoying my life as well. So every once in a while, I'll do a Pomodoro Technique on the weekends where I'm just relaxing or playing a video game or doing something. And then I'll do 25 minutes of playing a video game. That way I get up because I have dishes to do, you know, laundry, feed the dogs, you know, tend to the yard or whatever on the weekends. And so in my five minute breaks, I'll go to do that. So I don't do that all the time because the weekends are a little bit sacrosanct. You know, you got to you got to relax and stuff like that. But if I need to do something on the weekends and I don't feel like doing it, I'll, I'll do a reverse Pomodoro technique on weekends. <laughs> it might be better than the usual like procrastination. That's the thing. Yeah. It, it like helps. You, you got to do something. And then uh, those little things just add up. And then that way you don't feel like at the end of the night, ah, oh, I got to do all these. So that's really nice. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, yeah, I think um, uh, just like where I'm at now, everything's going to change. So the things you sign up for today, you know, if you were interested in particular techniques and things like that, be flexible. Uh, on it. Uh, there's a lot to learn. The thing you're doing now is not always going to be the thing that you're going to end up with. Um, and you know, that's just, uh, that's just nature. And that's the way, uh, that business works. So be flexible, learn something new. And I'll go ahead and include the Pomodoro technique in this. If you want to learn something new, I know this works out. I did this with a closure programming language. I had, uh, I had told myself I'm going to do two Pomodoros for me in the morning, because that's when my brain is really squishy and, uh, and super absorbent, do two Pomodoros at the beginning of a day to learn something new or end of day. You choose the time of day where your brain is the most uh, absorbent. Do two Pomodoros uh, every workday. Don't do it on weekends, but every workday. You're going to find you're going to do, you're going to learn a lot about a particular technology actually very quickly uh, by doing so. So that's a really cool technique. And as a reward, <laughs> everything that you learn, go in and sign up for a uh, local user group. Uh, that's the way I got started. So, uh, you know, try a Java group, a Ruby group, a Python group, a machine learning group. Uh, look for user groups in your area and uh, tell them what you know. And then um, who knows where uh, you're going to go from there. Life is uh, great that way. I feel like different user groups actually have different age demographics. They do. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, I think the uh, Java demographics are getting older, but, you know, we always want, you know, new people to sign up and do talks and things like that. Um, I think there's that. And I think there's also going to be a shift uh, if Java, uh, and I th I'll say when, <laughs> when Java catches up on the ML space, it could be they're going to have the mindshare again and uh, we're going to get young people in. So just like an ocean, things change, movements change, and uh, yeah, we'll see where it go from there. That's actually a really good point. Like once Java and AI meet, then right. there will be a huge change. Yeah, absolutely. Or at least that's what I'm counting on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to talk about? Like maybe points in your talk or? Uh, yeah, so I'm here at GIDS. Uh, of course, GIDS 2024. This is the first time I've ever been here, so. Uh, everything's been uh, really excellent. Uh, I've been doing a couple of Kafka talks. I did a uh, just get to know Kafka. Uh, I'm now uh, uh, later on this afternoon, I'm going to be doing a Kafka streams with KSQLDB. That one's really exciting. So that one is take a pub sub and uh, do something with it uh, immediately. So if you take, for example, someone submitting a, um, you know, a credit card request or something like that, uh, I want to take that information and I want to ingest it and then decide whether I want to give them a credit card or not. That's a streaming process. And you do that very quickly. Uh, and it's a real-time ETL or extract, transform, and load. And the ETL part, one of the things that uh, one presentation that I have 
is machine learning data pipelines, which is use a streaming framework to extract, and as part of the transformation, uh, submit that over to a machine learning network. In my presentation, I use TensorFlow Serving. So if you get a credit card report, submit that to TensorFlow Serving, and it'll come back with the uh, percentages as to whether you want to provide this person a credit card or not based on some sort of training model. And then you can go ahead and publish that uh, back into another Kafka topic. Kafka is great because they have, you know, for every topic, you could take the information for it and pipe that over into a database. So it's a lot of fun. Real so isn't time. TensorFlow like a AI JavaScript? Back it's in? a JavaScript, uh, but it's also Python. I think I got started with Python, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, so are like, developed in Python. Are credit cards now using AI to determine if they're valid? I'm pretty sure they are. I don't work for a bank, but I'm, I'm pretty sure AI uh, is used for that. Um, and I'm pretty sure they're, they, hopefully they're doing it responsibly. Uh, we've been, uh, uh, or I've been attending a lot of talks here just about AI. And I, I think most of us in the technical community know this, that AI is great, but not to be fully trusted at the first round or second round or third round, right? Always, always doubt your AI is always a good thing because you don't know what the models are looking at. You don't know how they're hallucinating and things like that. Always, always, always uh, monitor your AI. Do you think it brings up ethical issues when you have AI deciding things? Yeah, absolutely. So I am, <laughs> we're going off the political cliff here, but uh, I'm a firm believer of, you know, uh, police, uh, or, you know, uh, airport security, uh, and a lot of these, um, you know, a lot of these, um, you know, any kind of law enforcement that are using AI, I get really nervous about it. Whenever your civil liberties are at stake, um, you know, I don't, I don't like the idea of AI. I was just reading an article this morning about, uh, police using AI to automatically fill out police reports. I'm horrified at that prospect because, and, but you know, lawyers need to step in as well. <laughs> I'm a big fan of lawyers when it comes to AI. I know that's probably going to, I just made your video controversial by the way. Uh, but, um, you know, I think there is a really huge opportunity. If you want to invest in it, law and AI is I think going to be a very satisfying job. I think it's going to be a very lucrative job and it's going to be a big necessity. I think if you are if you want to ever decide for that kind of career, asking questions of where did you get this, uh, how did you train your model, uh, why did it come up to this decision? I need to see the training uh, model. I need to see the data that it was involved as part of any kind of litigation, because you'd hate to go to prison over some AI model making some kind of, you know, hallucination that you should be in jail for some crime that you didn't commit. So. You know, that's that's where I'm leery on AI. But AI for credit card applications, yes, with a but, you know, people with um, people with credit card, there could be uh, one of the uh, uh, ideas that someone told me about Brian Slutton. Uh, he said that if you bring in, and part of the hallucination is, if you bring in a zip code as a column called a feature as well, if you bring in that zip code, and the training model trains on your particular zip code, then it could be, hey, you live in a poorer community because that zip code is associated with a poorer community, and so therefore you're not gonna get a credit card just purely based as a bias uh, on your neighborhood. It could be you're doing well, it could be that you know you started to live in a poorer neighborhood and, and uh, you're doing a lot better, but if it doesn't detect that, and if you don't include that in the training model, you're gonna be pigeonholed and you know, you're not going to be able to get, you know, credit for opening a business or getting a house or other things like that. So there, there are huge detriments. I mean, they could be really small, like what zip code you're in. I think that's where the lawyers come in. Lawyers, yeah. I know. It's all about go lawyers. But, you know, as far as this AI thing, I think it's going to be something that, uh, you know, we're going to have to take, at, uh, take a look at legally. Uh, the other thing is, you know, the copyright. Whenever we uh, use a model, there's, there's, there's data that it took things from. Uh, and some of it is somebody's copyrights. Someone owned that. And so there's a lot going on there. There's a uh, comedian, Sarah Silverman, uh, who I think is, who she, who did she, she sued one company about, yeah, hey, these jokes come from me. 
you got to pay me for that. So uh, lawyers everywhere. Yeah. So yeah, we'll see how that turns out. Probably over the course of a year or two, there will be lots of fun things going on. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's uh, it's the new world. So and we need to uh, figure out how we're going to adjust uh, adjust to AI. But uh, yeah, I don't think it's a magic. Um, I don't think it's a magic bullet. I think it's really helpful as developers. Uh, I think it's great. And they do offer solutions, but again, uh, you know, always have that doubt, always have your suspicion that, and eh, maybe this isn't the right way to go about it. But I think it's a wonderful tool. I think we covered a lot of interesting topics today. Yeah, maybe yeah. a little controversial, but yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so thank you for talking to me All today. Right. Absolutely, it's been great. Cassandra, yeah, absolutely great. Thank you very much.